Hello and welcome to the Outlet channel. I'm Domingos Criado and this is the OR2 track where I publish videos around the specification around this subject. This video is going to be about the authorization code flow. Let's get started. So, so first let's recap. So authorization code flow is a grant type of uh, OR2. OR2 enables API clients to access re protected resources on domains with limited capacity. The traditional server is required to support at least two endpoints on the OAuth specification. The first one is authorization endpoint where the resource owner will interact with in order to grant access to the client. And the second endpoint is the token where the client itself used the authorization code to fetch a token out of it. Authorization code is one of the four grant types defined on the OAuth specification. So let's deep dive and slice and dice the protocol. So the implied context of the authorization code flow before starting is that the resource owner and the client are interacting. And in order to client to have access to the protected resource, it's going to create a request and send the resource owner browser to the authorization endpoint of the authorization server. So the request of the client will be a 302. It's going to be a redirect to the authorization server and all the parameters I send on the URL. So the, the parameters that the client might send it is the first one is the client ID. That's mandatory. That's going to identify itself. The, the response type is also a parameter that is required. And for authorization code flow, the client starts it with a response type equals to code meaning that it's a code that we want as a response of the traditional server. A list of scope that will be required. It's not, it's not mandatory, but in practice, yeah, everyone uses it. A list of permissions that the client is asking for. The state, that's an optional parameter, but it's highly recommended. That's used for preventing cross-site request forgery. I'll show in a further video how the state can be used here. The redirect URL, that's the endpoint that the client will provide it for getting back the authorization code flow. That's not required if the client has only one uh, endpoint. What is this client redirect URI? So the when the, the first request the client will do is a redirect to the browser. It might be a full page moving, or it can be, for instance, an iframe getting loaded on the on, inside the content of the client itself that's getting shown, or pop-ups, whatever. The OAuth specification does not restrict how the this redirection is done, but uh, what will happen is that the redirection needs to be happen, and a, but a content needs to be rendered from the authorization server on the resource owner browser. The authorization server will respond with a get on that endpoint. So. In other words, a content will be rendered on the browser that's going to run the process of authorizing the client. And that content needs to be replaced by the authorization server to send the customer back to the client. So the, the AS response will be a redirect to that endpoint with the authorization code. One sideline here is that the client does not re require to register uh, only one single redirect endpoint. It might be used different endpoints for that, depending upon the factor, depending upon the flavor of the client that's getting running, right? So if it is a, for instance, a web flow, it might use one, one redirect URL. If it's a mobile app, it can be used a different one. If it is a desktop application, it might be a different one. The client will send a redirect response to the browser. The browser will request that endpoint. We'll send a GET request to the authorization endpoint. That will be the original URL with the parameters on it on the query string, as well as the, the session cookie that have been established before this process happened. So that will allow the authorization server to detect if the authentication is required or not, right? So. If the user is required to log in or if the identity needs to be proven or if the, the grant needs to be taken explicitly, the authorization server will render a content to be rendered on that where it's getting loaded. 
and the browser will inquire the, the user to fulfill it in order to submit it, right? So let's say if the user is required to do identity proofing or identity verification using uh, MFA, uh, that might happen, might take place here. One other aspect is, for instance, rendering a form where the user will select, pick and choose what are the permissions that he going to grant to the to the client. After the user has granted a set of permissions and authorized it, the authorization server will render a redirect response where it's going to send it back to the client with, the, with the redirect URI on it, plus the code and the state on it. That will allow the, the browser to invoke that endpoint on the client and then the, the, with the, the state, the client can reason about it and make sure that the, it, it's a reasonable request. After the client received the authorization code, it will post to the token endpoint and the body of it will have the grant type equals to code, the code itself, the redirect URI that was used when starting the process on the first request, and, and it's going to have the client ID plus the credential, the optional credential, depending upon if the client needs to be logged in or not. That credential can might be, for instance, a secret, a long password, or it can be something different like MTLS certificate, or it might be a token signed by a private key. So there's a multiple forms that this authentication can happen. The, sec, the, the response of the token endpoint will be an access token, optionally a refresh token, if the client is allowed to extend its session, a granted scope or with the list of the other granted scopes on it, and the time to live of the token in seconds. Right? So let's recap the entire flow. So first, the client starts the authorization process using a redirect to the browser, including the client ID, the redirect URI, the list of the scopes, and a state parameter. The browser connects to the authorization endpoint, sending the set get request plus any session cookie that, that was already established. The second piece of it, the authorization server might require the customer to log in and providing the specifically consentment on the permissions. The authorization server then render a redirect response to the browser back into the client, including the authorization code plus the state on it. The client now can reason about it if the request is valid or not. And then the client will send that authorization code in a POST request to token endpoint, including the redirect URL, the grant type equals to access token, the credentials, and it will get back from the token endpoint, the access token, and optionally a refresh token, a granted scopes, and the time to live of the token. So let's check out the, the key points of the authorization code flow. So the first one is that suitable for every scenario. It can be used by native apps, it can be portal, pure portal, or old old fashioned apps, uh, na native, so you name it. Another aspect of the traditional code flow is the central place that the browser has on the coordination between the client and the traditional server. Doesn't mean that, uh, and and there's no, and the authorization request parameters get through the, the browser as well as the traditional code get also through that. The OAuth itself doesn't have a mechanism for protecting it from the browser itself. So everything is go to the browser and that's one of the main area where we see a lot of different specifications going getting published to cover and fix this thing and getting more secure approach on this. Another aspect is there's a clear segregation between the authentication and the authorization. So if you look at the flow, you see the request number one and number three, all of them are related to the authorization process, while the authentication is only required on the second flow. So which means that it's just between the browser and authorization server. Client itself not getting involved at all. 
which means that implementing an O2 authorization does not preclude what you already have invested on authentication and state management of the customers and identity verification. And that statement is the crux for the Outlet platform design. All the features of the platform was designed around allowing you to build all the OAuth and OpenID Connect features, as well as multiple others like FAPI profiles, SIBO profiles, and stuff like that. Everything on top of your infrastructure without requiring you to redo or throw away anything. So if you look at that, just a quick peek on the, on the whole stack, how this looks like. So Outlet. It's going to be your backend for your authorization server. Your authorization server can implement multiple profiles and specifications, relying solely on delegating it to the outlet platform that will allow you to rapidly deploy authorization servers on top of it. So you should know more about an outlet, get in touch on the, our website, and we are glad to hear from you, and I'm glad to explain to you all the ins and outs of the platform. Okay, so that was it for the authorization code flow, the beginning of it. Later, there will be other videos showing different aspects of it, the security part of it, how the refresh token extends it, how the privacy relates to this, as well as all the specifications on it. So if you don't want to miss any video, subscribe to the channel. And if you like it, give us the thumbs up. Okay, talk to you. Bye.